John chapter 1 verses 6 through 14 and uh, then of course Philippians 2. I'm going to read verse 10 and verse 14 of John 1 and then the Philippians passage. Of course verse 10, verse 6 through 9 uh, is referencing the ministry, the life, the work, the labor of John the Baptist. And then Lee in verse 10 John picks back up talking about Jesus. So verse Verse 10 and then verse 14. He, Jesus, was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him, did not recognize him and really did not receive him. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth. Philippians, the words of Paul, the pen of Paul writes this passage. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance, King James says, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Beloved, for three days last week, uh, Victor, First Lady and I attended a conference of faith leaders from around the country uh, and across denominational lines. Um, this conference was focused on a project, a vision, a movement, a campaign that we believe or is believed will have the potential to reach millions of people with the good news of the story of Jesus. I referenced that project, some of you may remember, Kevin, a few months ago in one of my sermons. Uh, it is entitled, The He Gets Us Campaign. And uh, Lee, the focus of that campaign is to show in various ways on multiple media platforms the fact, the truth, the belief, the teaching that Jesus understands us, that Jesus gets us, as it were, primarily, significantly, because he in fact became one of us. And in doing so, Herschel, he is able, as the writer of Hebrews says, to not only identify with us, but to go to God for us on our behalf. In one of the sessions, Pop, uh, at this three-day conference, the team that put this whole campaign together was telling us, sharing with us, how the whole campaign came about. And interestingly enough, uh, it began, it was birthed really with a question. Someone, we were told, someone uh, asked one of the originators of this campaign, someone asked him this question. How did the greatest love story in the world become known as a hate group. I'm going to try that one more time. Question asked of this man that sparked this He Gets Us campaign was this question. How did the greatest love story in the world become known as a hate group? 
Now, now some of y'all, Herschel, some of them sitting here right now trying to figure out what in the world is Pastor talking about. Well, what I'm talking about, what I'm referencing, what I'm referring to is the fact that statistics show us that in the minds of many people, unsaved, unchurched, unreached people, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christians, believers in Christ, are better known for what they are against than they are for what they're for. And that in the mind, stay, I know this is in the words of Al Gore, an inconvenient, uncomfortable truth. But in the minds of many unsaved people, when they look at us, when they think about us, they do not think about our love. What they think about are all the things, wait a minute, and all the people we are against. It's sad, beloved, it's sad that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is known as, in the minds of many, as a hate group. Think about it. White Christians hate black Christians. Black Christians hate white people. Christians who are saved hate homosexuals. Send me some love or send me some prayers. I'll take whatever I can get. Oh, we hate Republicans. We hate Democrats. We're, we're against progressives. We're against conservatives. We're against abortion. We're against same-sex marriage. We're against, uh, what, what, what's the newest thing? Critical race theory. The church is known for what it is against more than what it is for. And in the minds of many unsaved people, in the minds of many unbelievers, in the minds of many seekers and searchers, we are no longer known as a kingdom of love, but we're known as a group that hates. How in the world, Larry Wonder, how in the world did the greatest love story in the world become known as a hate group. Why is it that the church, which Jesus said, by this will all people know you are my disciples. Come on, y'all, work with me. I'm in the book, in the words of my father in love. It's in the book. By this will all people know that you are my disciple by how you love one another. Now, now, Sister Kelly, here's what's amazing to me. It is not, people will not know we are his disciples by our political party affiliation. I'm going to preach today whether you say amen or not because I'm so right I can't be wrong. Jesus did not say, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your doctrinal purity. Jesus did not say, by this will all people know that you are my disciples by the proliferation of your spiritual gifts. The acid litmus test of whether or not we belong to God in Christ is by how we love one another. Uh, it's getting real quiet in first church. I hope online is helping me, but that's all right because every now and then it is the job of the pulpit to not only comfort the disturbed, but to disturb the comfortable. And one of my jobs is to remind you that in many ways the church is flunking the test of whether or not we really belong to Christ. Can, can we love folk? Not like us? Uh, can we love those different from us? Can we love those we vehemently disagree with? And can we love those whose very behavior, whose conduct literally offends us? Can we love them? 
Tracy, can we engage them? Can we embrace them without endorsing their lifestyle? Come on, y'all ain't going to help me preach today. See, because part of the problem is, oh, you're watering down the gospel. Oh, you, you're making it too easy. No, listen, we've made it too hard. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. We're the ones added all this other stuff. Can we love one another? Can we even when we are different and we are differing, can we still reach out in love and say, I may not like what you did, but I still love you. Well, y'all getting quiet on me. Or would we rather, would we rather Larry be known as a hate group? Would we rather be known for our picket lines? Holy, I'm going to get in real trouble. Uncle George, you praying? We had, back first Sunday in November, a month ago today, we had several of our um, elected officials here, you know, and this is the place to go. If I was running, I'd come here too. <laughs> All of y'all sitting up here, captive audience, I'd come here too. And uh, as happens all the time, you know, we had folk cross the street, Christians. Deacons, Lumpkins, y'all pray. Christians with these nasty signs. Christians with these hate-filled words. I'm against abortion, but my God, I'm not going to be outside with a picture of a fetus uh, trying to discourage and disparage a young lady who has to make the toughest decision of her life. Okay, here, is that what Jesus would do? Is that how Jesus would act? No. Nah. If, if you do, if you go by what he did with the woman at the well and the woman caught in adultery and it may be that our doctrinal purity is more important to us than our salvific experience that is fleshed out in how we interact with one another. While we worry about eschatology and soteriology we're worried about pneumatology and Christology. It might be we ought to be involved and concerned about some loveology. <laughs> By this, oh hallelujah, will all people know? Lee, Mom Edwards, Tracy, by this, will everybody know? You're my disciple. By how you love one another. One of the tragedies, when that gentleman said that the other day, it shook me from center to circumference. He said, this man asked him, how did the greatest love story in the world become known as a hate group? The church is better known for what and who we hate than for representing the one of whom it was said, for God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever and Trish, Sister Kelly, see that's what messes us up. We, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone, deacons, before y'all have to come up here and sit me down. I'm going to leave it alone. But, but since I'm up here, let me stir the pot. We, we, we say we believe the Bible. We really don't. We really don't. That whosoever. Now, y'all say y'all believe. Y'all love to quote John 3.16, but you don't want to take into account not only the theological, but the relational practical implication. For God so loved a God paid the whole world, not the cosmos, but all of the people, the anthropos. Oh, God, I feel like preaching that day. Deacon Mac, I feel like preaching. See, see, we, we here. Do y'all have time for this? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We, we think in cosmos, you know, the, the land, the sea, 
the sky, the star. That's cosmos. No, that, that is not, John is not talking about God loving the cosmos. Though he does, because he made it, and we ought to take care of it. I don't care what folks say, there is such a thing as global warming and pollution, and we have jacked up God's creation. But that's another sermon for another time. God so loved the world. It is not cosmos, it is anthropos which we get the word anthropology, which, which we mean men, humanity, people. God so loved the world. God so loved people. The anthropos in the cosmos that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but would have everlasting life. Do you and I really believe the whosoever tense in the text? Or is it only Church of God children? Is it only the descendants of the saints? Is it only the morally nice and the socially correct? Or does whosoever include gays? Does whosoever include transgender? Does whosoever include those strung out on drugs? Does whosoever include those born out of wedlock? Does who, okay, y'all ain't helping me. Not, not, not that we tell them you stay that way, but you come to God that way and the power of God and the blood of Jesus and the efficacious work of the Holy Spirit. If anyone be in Christ, oh God, oh God. I feel old school. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is passed away. And behold, look at here. <laughs> Everything, all things become new. How, how did, I, I raise this query, I lift this interrogative one more time. How did the greatest love story in the world become known as a hate group. I would argue, Tracy, and I'm, I'm pretty near, I've, I have 20 minutes because we have to serve communion. I am convinced it is because we have lost a sense of the real Jesus. Yeah. Whoo! It, it may be, it may be Hershey, it may be Hershey that the Jesus we are preaching is not the Jesus of the Bible. It, it may be, it may be the Jesus we are proclaiming is not the Christ of history, not the Christ of scripture, but a Christ we have reinvented and made in our image after our likeness so that he looks more like us than we try to look like him. So we've made Jesus African or African American. We've made him white or we've made him democratic, or we've made him Republican, or we've made him male and American. Y'all getting quiet on me. It may be the reason why the world sees us as a hate group as opposed to love folk is because we aren't presenting to them the real Jesus but a Jesus we've conjured up to endorse us rather than our lives endorsing him. <sighs> that is why <laughs> this series I've been in September is so important and why that's in general, but why more specifically this Advent series that I'm doing the month of December is so vitally important because what I'm trying to do in this final installment of the story of Jesus, this Johannian uh, perspective of, of Jesus uh, from the Gospel of John is I'm trying to find out who Jesus really is. 
Because here it is, and I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. Did I tell y'all that already? I am going to leave it alone in about 20 minutes. I'm going to leave it alone. Watch this. Watch this. I'm convinced we got to rescue Jesus because he's being held hostage. Last week, I talked about the beginning of Jesus. Now, let me remind you, in the beginning was the word, word was with God, the word was God. And I reminded you last week, in talking about the beginning of Jesus, we are not in any way assuming or stating or asserting that the beginning of time was the beginning of Jesus. No, uh, Jesus was in the beginning, but he was in the beginning before the beginning began. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. We looked at the beginning of Jesus. This morning, for the next 16, 17 minutes, I want to look at what I'm calling the being of Jesus. Everybody say the being of Jesus. Now, now that, that word, Deacon Sylvia, the being of Jesus, I take it from the definition in the, uh, in, in the common dictionary, which is the fact of existing substance or nature. Uh, to be, the being, to be or not to be, that is the question. The being of a thing is the fact of that thing existing and existing in its substance or nature. So that be, y'all still there? Somebody said, when did this become a lecture? Being then is this, a person exists, that's, it's the fact that the person exists, but then it's also how that person exists. And in looking at the being of Jesus, there are three manifestations that confront us, but I think also inform us as John talks about it in the text and Paul talks about it in Philippians 2. So are y'all ready to dive into it with me? Okay, that was 17 folk. Let's try it again. Y'all ready to dive into it with me? Okay, uh, here's, everybody say first. The being of Jesus. Here it is. Here it is, deacons. In essence, Jesus is God. Now, 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 but chairman, but vice chairman, both John and Paul show us this in clear and compelling ways. John says, in the beginning was the word, word was with God, and the word was God. Paul says in Philippians 2, who, talking about Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to. In essence, y'all stay with me, Jesus is God. In, okay, I'm going to try it one more time. In essence, everyone say in essence. And the word essence, you know, means basic, real, or invariable nature. Uh, all right, so, so essence is the core of me the very center of me. It is the basic, real, invariable part. It's the part of me that never changes. It's my essence. Has to do with core, essential, vital part of a person or a thing. So at his core, beloved, in his essence, in his being, Jesus is God. I love that hymn of this season. I quote it more often than y'all want to hear it. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. That is, that's it right there. Jesus in essence in his being is God. He's God. I'm going to try it again. I want it to sink in. Online, Erica, uh, Sister Maureen, Sabrina, I want y'all to get it. Sister a a Angie, you and David, listen. Jesus is God in his essence, at his core. This, Kevin, it is invariable. You know, variable means changing. Invariable means it doesn't change. In his invariable essence, Jesus is God. Now, there are three aspects. Here's A. Consider with me, A, the mystery of that. This is the mystery of it. God became man. Mm. The divine became human. The creator became the created. 
this is the best part. The Savior became sin. What a mystery. <laughs> God, I wish I had a half a church. I'd preach. What a mystery. Kevin, it makes no, this is your birthday. On your, it makes no sense that God, infinite, mighty, majestic, full of splendor, glory, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, God became man. It's a mystery. But it's not just the mystery of it. There's the might of it. That word might means superior power or strength. It's power, ability to do or to accomplish. Here's what I mean by that. Only as God could Jesus save us. Only God could redeem us. Only God could forgive us. Only God could reconcile. Y'all aren't getting this. Because of who he is, he was able to do what he did. And what, by God, thank you God, I want to shout right there. And what he still does. <sighs> that old song, he is just the same today. He is just the same. Yes, he healed in Galilee. Set the suffering captives free. And he's just the same today. Only by his power is he able to do what he did and still does. Save those who come to him and call on him. But there's not just the mystery of it. There's not just the might of it. Beloved, there's the majesty of it. Majesty being supreme greatness or authority. Think, think with me of what the incarnation means and what it accomplished. If you ever think about it, the incarnation is majestic, supremely great, wondrous, and wonderful. <sighs> that he could love us so much, care about us so much. There's the mystery of it, the might of it, but there's also the majesty and the splendor. It is, it is splendiferous <laughs> that he would do that. Well, not only in essence is Jesus God, but, but watch this. In essence, Jesus is God, but in expression, Jesus is man. Somebody said, what in the world did he just say? In essence, Jesus is God. But in expression, Jesus is man. That's what Paul and John argued. John 1.14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. Philippians 2.8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The late Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor used to say, in the face of Jesus is all the God I need to see. The late Pastor William Tipton said, Jesus is the best picture God ever took. I feel like shouting right there. And both of those statements are true because in expression, Jesus became a man. Okay, I know, I know y'all are saying, now I didn't want to go to seminary because I'm not a preacher. So let me break it down. In, in his essence, Jesus is God. Invariable. He does not change. But in his expression, oh God, I thank you. He's a man. He came into this. Okay, y'all sitting here like y'all about to go to sleep. I'm not going to let you do it. Isn't that what Christmas is all about? Okay, okay, y'all, you're not sure. Well, it's sure ain't about Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It, it's, it's not about the, is it the North or the South Pole? Wherever he's supposed to live. It's not, it, it's about a manger in Bethlehem. It's about a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. It, it's about a virgin giving birth to a child. It's about God becoming us. So that in expression, the one who is in essence God expresses himself as a man. Woo. I don't know, Bill, if y'all getting excited. I'm excited about that. 
Because nobody but Jesus can do that. In essence, God never stops being God. I'm going to teach that in a moment. But in his expression, how we are exposed to him is as a man. <laughs> so as a man, Jesus does three things. Write these down. A, he stands with us. Uh, by that I mean, Bill, he identifies with us. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was attempted in every point like we are, yet was without sin. He, identifies, he stands with me. Y'all should be shouting right there. Aren't you glad you're not standing by yourself today? He stands with us. But he stands with us as a man so that he can identify. He is the next one. He suffered for us. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he interceded on our behalf. He suffered what should have been put on us was put on him. And then see, here it is. He sacrificed his life to save us. So his standing with us means he identifies. His suffering for us means he intercedes. But hey, y'all, his sacrificing for me means he interposes. Okay, y'all y'all, still sleep? That's right. I get you when I close. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Y'all know I love that song. It's not my favorite song. It's my dad's favorite song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. My favorite song is Blessed the Church. Dad's favorite song was Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. There's that line in there where it says, interposed his precious blood. You know what that word interposes me? It's, it's one of the most beautiful words in the world. We ought to use it more. It means to place between, to intervene, to break in on. <laughs> Y'all missed it. It, it. it means to come between. It means to intervene. It means to break in on. Here it is that Jesus sacrificed his life for us so that he could interpose. He could break in on what the devil was doing in our life. And I wonder do I have anybody in first church in the room or online who can just shout with me that when the devil thought he had you, Jesus broke broke in on it. Tell, tell the neighbor, say he interrupted it. He intervened. He interposed. He broke through on it. He stopped. Okay, okay. Everything the devil tried. Okay, y'all ain't got it yet. I said everything the devil tried, God made it fail. I, I need somebody to shout right there. Say, neighbor, that's why I love him. That's why I praise him. That's why I serve him. Everything the devil tried. And by God, anybody here know he does try. But can you shout with me that whatever he tried, God uh, 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 I ain't gonna do it. I got another point. Somebody holler, say, God made it fail. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be when my enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh? They stumbled and they fell. Though a host should arise against me, my heart shall not fail. I double dog dare you to holler, God made it fail every he intervenes interposes interjects and interrupts because he is man essence God expression man Third point, I got five minutes. Here it is. In essence, Jesus is God. In expression, Jesus is man. Are y'all ready for a third one? In existence, Jesus is the God man. <laughs> Somebody said, now wait a minute, Ram. You know, you're just making up stuff. Essence, he's God. Okay. In expression, he's man. Okay. Now you got in existence, you done put them both together. He the God man. Yeah. Yeah, that's the greatest mystery of all, y'all. As it pertains to Jesus, his work of redemption. And that is, watch this, he did it all as the God man. 
Pop Logan, this teaching about Jesus as the God man has to do with the truth that Jesus has two natures in one person. The divine and the human. So that Jesus was fully human and fully divine at the same time. God, I wish I had a church here. I, I don't have time to, to, to argue with you about the theological and philosophical uh, questions of whether or not Jesus was man or God hanging on the cross, uh, whether, you know, the docetus or Gnosticism, was he God, was he man? Did he stop being God and just be man? Did he stop being man and was he God? If he was God, then he didn't feel the nails and he didn't feel the whipping and if he was man then he just as jacked up as we are but see that's why you got to understand the beauty of this doctrine he is in essence God he is in expression man but in existence he's the God man and that's why I keep telling y'all stop introducing preachers as something they could never be after the choir sings, the next voice we will hear is that of the God man, Bishop Timothy Clark. I'd be sitting there saying, God, don't strike me. Hit him. <laughs> Hit him. Don't strike me. I ain't saying it. I don't believe it. There is no God man but Jesus. God, I feel like there's no bishop, there's no apostle, there's no cardinal, there's no reverend doctor that equals and qualifies to be a God man. The only God man is Jesus because he was in the world. The world was made by him. The world did not know him, but to as many as did receive him, he gave them the power, the right, the authority, the legitimacy to become sons and daughters of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and full of truth. Would you help me close it and say neighbor, he is the God man, fully God and fully man all at the same time as the God man he accomplishes the plan of God which is our redemption as the God man he achieves the original purpose of God bringing us back into relationship as the God man he affirms the power of God to restore what has been lost and to bring us back into our proper place and position could nobody do that but a God man and I know some of y'all are saying well pastor I understand when you say he's God I can get it if you say he's man but I can't understand how he could be God man all at the same time well let me see if I can use the Bible to prove the Bible over in John 13 it opens up with a man by the name of Lazarus who's a friend of Jesus and they send word to Jesus he whom you love is sick Jesus does not leave he does not drop what he's doing but he stays there a few more days and says to his disciples we got to go to Bethany now because Lazarus is sleeping one disciple said well if he's sleeping he'll feel better Jesus said no Lazarus is dead and I'm glad for your sake uh, that I was not there. But let's go now because I got work to do. Uh, can I close it like I feel it? Uh, the Bible says uh, that when he got to Bethany uh, near the house of Mary and Martha, Miss Mary, uh, who'd been sitting at his feet, uh, who'd been worshiping him, has an attitude uh, and wouldn't even go out to meet him. But Martha gets up, uh, runs to the sepulchre and says to Jesus if you had showed up when we called you our brother would not have died Jesus said don't worry you're going to see your brother again Martha said yeah I know in the resurrection Jesus said what you say she said I know I'll see him in the resurrection Jesus said I've been eating at your house sleeping in your spare bedroom and you don't know who I am I am the resurrection 
and I am the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever believes in me, I feel like preaching, shall never die. The Bible says in John that he said, show me where you laid him. And when he got there, the shortest verse in the Bible in John 11, 35, just two words, Jesus wept. Can I tell you that that was the humanity of Jesus, a heart broken. That was the humanity of Jesus, grief stricken. That was Jesus the man crying over his friend. But a few verses later, he says, roll away the stone. And Martha says, you don't want to do that because by now he's stinking. Jesus said, roll it away. And then he stood at the mountain of the tomb and said in verse 43 Lazarus come here on his mother's side he's crying in verse 35 but on his daddy's side he's talking to dead folk and dead folk are responding on his mama's side he's looking at the grave his heart is breaking but on his daddy's side he's telling them roll the stone away cause I got work to do on his mama's side he's grief stricken and bereaved but on his daddy's side he's got power over death, hell, and the grave. He's the God man, and I'm so glad on his mama's side he can be touched with the feeling of my infirmity. On his mama's side he knows when my heart is breaking, but on his daddy's side he can wipe my tears, mend my heart, heal my scars, make me whole. Is there anybody here that can shout with me that in his essence he is God, in his expression he is man, but in his existence he's the God man. He's God and man wrapped up in one. He's God and man all at the same time. He has two essence, two natures, two beings wrapped up in one. No conflict, no contradiction, no confusion. So when I call him and my heart is breaking, he leans over to the father and says, Daddy, this is what he needs because I've been there done that and then the Holy Ghost comes to my rescue because can nobody oh shucks can nobody I done fooled around and feel like preaching can nobody do me like Jesus pick me up turn me around save my soul heal my body is there anybody here I wish I had Donnie McClurk in here Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freed me forever. One day he's coming. Glorious day. Lift up your head. Oh, ye gates, even lift them up. Ye everlasting door and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory he's the lord strong and mighty he's the lord mighty in battle lift up your head oh ye gates even lift them up ye everlasting door and the king
there is nobody like Jesus. In essence, he is God. In expression, he is man. But in his eternal existence, he is the God-man. With no conflict, no confusion, no contradiction. And maybe what we have to do is get about the business of rescuing and reclaiming Jesus. And stop allowing people to make him someone he never was. I want to thank you for allowing me to delve into deep theological truths with you. I know most churches don't have to sit through this. But for 40 years, I've tried my best to make you an informed people. I know that's more theology than you ever wanted to hear in your life. But I want you to know who he is. <laughs> so that when at the hair salon or the barber shop or in a classroom, somebody tries to debunk him, dismiss him, or deny him. You have both theological and scriptural reason to say, oh no, oh no, oh no. My church teaches me, my pastor teaches me that Jesus in his essence is God. That in his expression, he came in this world as a human being. But in his eternal existence, he is the, 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 the only God-man. And John 11 shows us, 35 verse 35 Jesus weeps verse 43 Lazarus come here <laughs> and the Bible says Lynette that Lazarus got up <laughs> and came bouncing <laughs> out of that grave and Pop Scott Dr. H. Oliver Scott Sr. talked to his son he told me to tell you how to he called me he, Howard Howard H.O. Scott Jr. Howard Timmy how was Josh I said, well, he's fighting a cold. So he told me to tell you he loves you and he's praying for you. We all grew up together, young preachers. Pop Scott, you say, it's a good thing that Jesus said Lazarus. He said, if he had just said, come forth, everything dead would have got up. <laughs> he said, Every, everything since Adam that ever died would have been jumping up, coming up. Because on his mother's side, he weeps, but on his father's side, as man, he weeps as God. He commands death. That is the Jesus we serve. And don't ever let anyone engage you in the diminution of Jesus. Don't you ever let anyone dumb Jesus down in your presence. He is too lofty. He is too holy. He is too great. He's too wondrous. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, everybody.